Anderson. Thank you all so much for being here. Uh, this is uh, one of those sessions, as she mentioned, uh, that we've received several requests from faculty members, and it's uh, definitely something that we want to uh, share about. So um, uh, let's just kind of dig right in. Before I do get into the content, uh, I want to make sure you know who all will be presenting today. Uh, I think most of you all know Dr. David Pauliano. He's back there at the door. He's a clinical psychologist and the director of our counseling center, and then also our, our brand new director of residential life and housing, George Bastani. He's right here, so basically we're going to go in that sequence, and then we're going to try to leave some time at the end to have a little dialogue, some Q&A. So please, uh, please uh, kind of follow away those questions, and we'd be happy to talk with you at the end of this session and also throughout the rest of this academic year, particularly in the spirit of partnership. Uh, so what, what I want to do is I want to try to establish that. Yeah. Mike, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but what we're going to hear, can we share or is this proprietary? No, you can definitely share it. And in fact, we're going to give you uh, the PowerPoint slides at the end. So uh, please feel more than free to, uh, to uh, uh, share this. And in fact, if you want the PowerPoint, we'll be happy to email it to you. Any other questions before we get into it? Yes. <laughs> It's being video recorded. Okay. That's good. Thank you. Yeah, I've always wanted to be a televangelist. <laughs> so I want to provide some context, and I want to start with this idea of understanding the times. Uh, I think it's critical for us to make sure that we understand what our, what our students are dealing with, uh, the different cultural voices that they're hearing in this regard. And um, I mentioned yesterday in my brief little pitch in the faculty seminar uh, about some of the professional literature that began to emerge about 15 years ago. And one of the key books was a book that was published now 14 years ago called The College of the Overwhelmed. And you can see the subtitle of the book, The Campus Mental Health Crisis and What to Do About It. Now, what's really interesting about this book is it was written not only for higher education professionals, but for parents who are thinking about sending their kids off to college. So this is written for a very wide audience, and it really uh, seeks to address, okay, how do we, how do we need to deal with this? Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to share just, just a really brief excerpt from this book, and you can follow along and see what they were saying. Again, now, again, go back 15 years. They were saying this 15 years ago. This is a book about the extraordinary increase in serious mental illness on college campuses today and what we, meaning professionals and parents, can do about it. If your son or daughter is in college, the chances are almost one in two that he or she will become depressed to the point of being unable to function. One in two that he or she will have regular episodes of binge drinking with a resulting significant risk of dangerous consequences such as sexual assault and car accidents and one in ten that he or she will seriously consider suicide. Now, this quote continues. In fact, since 1988, so again, you know, we're kind of kind of in this phase of looking backwards, and now we're talking about the past 30 years, the likelihood of a college student suffering depression is double, suicidal ideation is tripled, and sexual assaults have quadrupled. The information on student mental health presented throughout this book is shocking, yet it is the elephant in the room that no one is talking about. So this again is uh, uh, 14 years old, and what's fascinating about it is that depression, suicidal ideation, and the sexual assault, all of these have multiplied significantly uh, over the past 20 or 30 years. Now, uh, you might be saying, okay, that's great, that book is 14 years old, so, you know, it's kind of dated. But it's really intriguing. There was, there was a study that just came out in this past week that the Associated Press did, and they were interested in how colleges, particularly bigger universities, aren't tracking student suicides. So they were trying to say, okay, out of, out of all these major universities, how many of them actually track uh, completed suicides by their students? And the title of this uh, study was, Most Public Colleges Don't Track Suicides AP Fine. So you can Google this. This was published in the past week. The issue has come to the fore as some schools report today students are arriving on campus less prepared for the rigors of college. So we know that, in fact, many of you all have attended sessions through the, through, uh, through the CTE that Dr. Pauliana has done in terms of student resilience and whether or not they kind of have 
the characteristics and the makeup to succeed in college. Many schools have increased spending on mental health services to counter what the American Psychological Association and other groups have called a mental health crisis on campuses. So it's not just us crying wolf, it's not just us saying, well, somebody about 14 years ago published this book, you know, it kind of kind of garnered some attention, but we're talking about something within this past week. Now, there, there's a story as well, since we talked uh, a little bit about um, uh, some of the risk factors, uh, uh, but there was a story just a couple of years ago that was, that was published in the Chronicle of Higher Education about what colleges are trying to do to deal with binge drinking and alcohol consumption and all of the risky behaviors that uh, are often um, uh, related to that. So here is the title of that article, A River of Booze Inside One College Town's Uneasy Embrace of Drinking. Just a real quick quote. Colleges are inheriting alcohol problems that students develop in high school or even middle school. And again, it, this is something that we don't experience at quite the prevalence that other schools do. But, uh, you know, we're not in a bubble, as it were, particularly related to depression, anxiety, uh, and not just those, but really serious psychotic disorders and also suicidal ideation. Now, I don't know how many of you all have uh, heard of this book or or this Netflix series, but the name of the book, it was, it was published about 10 years ago, it was called 13 Reasons Why. And it was just um, translated into a Netflix series that gained a great deal of popularity, uh, of popularity over the past year, year and a half. So the premise of the book, and I hate to do the plot spoiling thing for you, but if you hadn't heard of it, I'm sorry, I'm about to do that too. <laughs> but uh, uh, the key character of the book is, is, is Hannah Baker. Hannah is a, uh, is a high school student, and she was uh, feeling desperate and feeling like she'd like to end her life. So what she did is she actually uh, wound up recording 13 cassette tapes that she asked 13 different people to listen to a tape that was designated for her or him, and then send the other tapes on to the other people down the line. So what she did is she basically, uh, by, by the end of the, of the narrative, uh, said, uh, listen, I was desperate, I wanted to take my life, and you had a chance to stop me, and you didn't. And one of those uh, key people was Clay Jensen, who's the narrator of the story, a guy that uh, she, she kind of had a fancy for, and interestingly enough, he for her to a certain extent. So basically, there's 13 reasons why is, there are 13 reasons why I'm dead now, because she did complete suicide in this story. Um, the book was written by a guy by the name of Jay Asher, who wrote it actually because a relative took her own life. And he wanted to raise awareness. Now, the response to this has been absolutely bifurcated. Some people are like, finally, some people are talking about this in a way that's really meaningful. And some people are like, this is the most unhealthy way of trying to raise awareness on this issue by actually creating a story that would seem to, in some people's opinion, glorify suicide. So you've got folks on this end saying this glorifies suicide, and then some people saying this glorifies suicide. One of the really interesting things in how they adapted the uh, novel to Netflix was in the novel she actually took her life by an overdose. But to kind of ramp up the effect in the Netflix series, she, she actually cut herself to death. So it's a little more dramatic, a little more intense. And uh, to say that this narrative took the youth culture by storm is, is a drastic understatement. So I encourage you to take a look at this, or at least some of the things that come from this. But, but what's really fascinating is at the end of the book, she uh, gives this final tape uh, to the 13th person who should have stopped her, at least in her estimation. And here is what she said uh, to this last person. I think I've made myself very clear, but no one's stepping forward to stop me. A lot of you cared, just not enough. And that, that is what I needed to find out. Now again, what I'm, what I'm trying to do is to create an awareness of what the adolescents in our culture are dealing with today. 
So to kind of tie it all together, we've got this amazing pressure on our students. And regardless of whether or not it's an issue of resilience, an issue of grit, an issue of the breakdown of the family, an issue of, of, of all the ill effects of religion, whether it's not, you know, they're playing too many video games, whether or not uh, the smartphone is taking over their lives emotionally. Again, there's some interesting research there. The bottom line issue is that they're dealing with pressures and they're having a difficult time dealing with those pressures. And that is why we're here. Now you might be thinking, okay, Mike, you know, that's, that's great. Thanks for quoting that stuff, the literature and all that kind of mumbo jumbo. But we here at Lee, we don't have to deal with that. Au contraire, mon frère. <laughs> we are not immune. In fact, I want to share with you just a few statistics and then we'll transition to being called out time. This is the percentage of Lee University Counseling Center clients endorsing a certain risk factor at intake. The first risk factor is self-injury. What that is is that it's self-injury. It's not intended to be a suicide attempt. It might be cutting or some other form of self-injury. So back 10 years ago, we had just over 16% of our intake clients say, yes, I've engaged in self-injury. Just about five years ago, that nearly doubled to over 30%, and now we're at 39.9%, or for all practical purposes, of 40%. So 40% of the new clients, the intake clients under counseling center, are saying, yes, I've struggled with self-injury. The second risk factor, seriously considered suicide. Ten years ago, nearly a third of the clients who showed up for the first time said, yes, I've actively considered suicide, seriously considered it. Just five years ago, that had increased by 10%. And now, just this past fall, over half of the clients showing up at our counseling center are saying, I have seriously considered suicide. Now, you might be wondering what that raw number is below that percentage. Those are the raw numbers of students. 101 of our students showed up in our counseling center in the fall saying, I've seriously considered suicide. 101. Now, please take a look down here. This does not include ongoing clients. 101 brand new students coming to our counseling center saying, I've actively considered suicide. In addition to the continuing clients. Now again, uh, we're not immune to it, and I mentioned this yesterday in my pitch for you to come here, and thanks for coming. We have had more than one student per week admitted to the hospital for psychiatric care this past semester. Now, uh, this again is nothing new, but the level of, uh, of, of intensity has been something that has, that has spiked on us. Um, you know, we used to maybe have one a month, maybe one every other week, but it has been consistent and the majority of these have been due to suicidality. So what do we do about it? That's obviously why we're here. So how do we respond to suicidal students? So let me just kind of cut to the chase and make sure you understand this, because periodically we do have the opportunity to talk with you about what to do. So this is very straightforward, and again, if you want to talk about this any further, please let us know. But if you're concerned about a student expressing suicidal ideation or thinking about it, contact me immediately. There's my office phone number. Somebody's there uh, from 8 to 5 every day. And if it's after hours, contact campus security. They can get a hold of me. So if they're thinking about it, give me a call because we want to be personally involved. Now, if uh, the, the, the attempt has occurred, if they have tried to harm themselves, <coughs> don't call me first. <laughs> the preservation of their life is more important than letting me know. So we want to get them the help that they need immediately. So call 911. Don't, don't hesitate. And then we'd love it if you contacted us so we can actually kind of follow through. And uh, oftentimes that will involve uh, meeting at the hospital, uh, contacting uh, the next of kin and whatnot. So the bottom line issue is this. We don't want you to kind of handle a hot potato. In fact, we also don't want you to call the counseling center. We don't want you to call residential life and housing if there's clear ideation or if there's an attempt. Basically, we can mobilize some resources a little more quickly because the counseling center is typically, hey, we're sitting down for 45 minutes to an hour talking with the student, and we don't have crisis response available, uh, availability through that office. 
So, uh, a little more information on caring for suicidal students. We're going to do an initial threat assessment, okay? What is, what is the press? Do they have a plan? Uh, if they have a plan, what's the level of lethality? Uh, if, they, if they have intent, how, how intent are they? So uh, those of us who work with this, we have experience. I used to work with the crisis response team here in town with a local mental health center. I used to go to the emergency room, do commitments with people. So we've got the training internally to deal with this kind of thing. We may try to hospitalize a student, whether it's voluntary or involuntary. I know a lot of people are like, well, why would you involuntarily commit somebody to the hospital to keep her in the lot? That's the last thing we want to do is to take away their rights, to take away their freedom. But if it means keeping them alive, then we'll seek that route. Most likely, we're going to refer the student to the Student Care Committee. It used to be called the Student Concerns Committee. But quite frankly, we uh, became a little concerned about that language. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a Student Care Committee. It's aimed a little bit more at, at, at case management. So the whole Student Care Committee is aimed at coordinating integrated care. We manage a caseload of approximately 40 students. And when I say we, I'll tell you who we is in just a minute. But this group of professionals meets for 90 minutes every Friday morning. And we review the care of about 40 students who are at significant risk. Now, let me, let me tell you what significant risk means today. We're talking about suicidality. We're talking about post-hospitalization post uh, care. We're talking about major mental illness. We're talking about major physical illness. We're talking about folks who have serious eating disorders, serious substance abuse, or they may actually be in some really uh, significant legal hot water. So about 40 students that we keep on our roster at a time. When we can, we want to communicate with faculty and staff. Uh, and again, when we can, so obviously there, there are privacy uh, issues and, and, uh, and all the uh, patient information stuff that would come into play. So when we can, we want to communicate with faculty. Sometimes it's just difficult. So who is the we? Here's the we. The Student Care Committee, and then I'll transition to Dave here in just a second. But Brittany Gates, who is uh, one of our counselors in our counseling center, she's been uh, in our counseling center now for a number of years, so she's there. Erin Loon, obviously director of uh, student success. Caitlin Graves. Kate, uh, you came in, right? Okay. Uh, so, uh, somebody will know Kate as, as a student. She is now a student in our Master's in Marriage and Family Therapy. She is our case manager. We started this position about two or three years ago. We took some money from one area and shifted it over because this was a much more pressing need. So this is a partnership now between first year programs and student development. So Kate, raise your hand so everybody knows who you are. So if you get an email from Caitlin Graves, the situation is probably great. Okay, so that's an easy way to remember it. So please respond to it. Please respond to it. Uh, Kirstie Williams, we do have full time faculty representation on this committee. Kirstie meets with us every week for 90 minutes. So we uh, love having her input. And of course, uh, she's a licensed marriage and family therapist and a dang good one. Uh, Kristen Pope, involved in our LEAP program. LaJuan Bradford, again, director of academic support. Mandy Stockton, who's here, she's our assistant director uh, of, how, of, of residential life. Mickey Moore, director of our health clinic. I chair the thing. Uh, Morgan Jones, our assistant director for housing. And finally, Stacy York, who's the administrative assistant in our office. And she supports the group. So this is the student care committee. Again, 90 minutes every Friday morning to help support and integrate the care of about 40 students who are at significant risk. Okay, at this time, I'm going to turn it over to David, and David is going to talk with you about student psychological needs with a particular eye toward how the Counseling Center and faculty can collaborate better. David, thank you. Trying to do the same thing as my uh, give a bit of an overview of uh, the circumstances as we see them, the interventions that the counseling center is doing, but also uh, some pragmatics as far as um, what you as faculty can do, uh, not just in responding to suicidality or mental health crises, but in collaborating in general uh, with the counseling center and others on campus in order to try to form 
um, holistic caring systems uh, for the students that we care about. Can you speak a little more loudly? Because when you turn your face, then it's hard to feel right here. And I know you want to talk about this. Not a problem at all. <laughs> Thank you. Heather, <coughs> is that first? <laughs> it, it might be. Um, so uh, I, I want to start with just a little bit as far as data. Some of it's national data, some of it is counseling center data. Um, in general, over at least eight years, maybe longer, we've seen an increase. But there are two different increases that kind of merge together. So um, if we look at counseling center data, uh, it's evidence of a national trend where there's increased service demand. There are more students coming requesting therapy services for one reason or the other. Um, so you can see that just comparing fall intakes uh, from 2014 until now, uh, there's a significant increase up from 142 to 214, uh, which I, I didn't superimpose how the campus was growing, but it, that's not just increasing at the same pace that the campus is growing we've got a greater percentage of students coming. Um, then I have national data that also supports another important aspect of the trend. It's not just more students coming to us, but the students who are coming to us are more severe. They have uh, more difficulties that they're dealing with. And what, what the bottom statistics there say um, are those students who are dealing with non-suicidal self-injury in their history or suicidality in their history. They need more therapy in order for therapy to be effective. So the statistic here basically says that they are receiving about 30% more therapy than clients used to receive in order to have effectiveness. So we have more people needing more therapy per person, uh, which is kind of a double increase in that service demand. As I go through the rest of my slides, if you end up tuning out, Pay attention to this one slide. These are the two main points that, that I really want to drive home. Uh, the Counseling Center is about more than counseling. Uh, on a lot of campuses, it's called the Counseling and Psychological Services or something like that. Uh, but we as the Counseling Center, at least, we're, we're more than just doing therapy and crisis response. And, and so I, I want you to have a little bit broader picture of who we are and what we're hoping to be for and on this campus and, and in collaboration with you. Uh, and then the second piece, our vision, when it comes to what we're doing, but what all of us are doing with students, is collaborative care. So our vision is developing and sustaining student mental health. It, it requires systemic, whole campus and beyond campus collaborative care, not just therapy and not just our counseling center. So those are my take home points here. And let me elaborate on that a little bit on what we're doing, what we'd love to do with you and partner with you and things like that. Um, so four years ago when I took over as director, we really attempted to have a paradigm shift at the counseling center because the majority of what we were doing was therapy. And on the side, when we had time, if res life or faculty member was asking us to come do some sort of outreach with some group of students they'd identified on some topic that they'd identified, we'd say, sure, one day in time we'll come and we'll talk about it. But there's a handful of reasons why we wanted our brand to be more than that. Uh, that we wanted outreach to look different, and we wanted us to be representing more than just doing therapy. 10% versus 100%. So what I mean there is, in an average year, about 10% of our students come to the counseling center seeking some sort of service from us. But that means that in any given year, 90% of the students are not asking for our services. And I would assume that does not mean that 90% of the students have no psychological factors in their lives, and that they have no psychological needs. So what are we doing about these other 90%? We have to do more than therapy. But then I want to broaden out a little bit more. A lot of students have psychological needs that need caring response. But not all those students need psychotherapy from professionals. But they do need something from their community, from people who care about them. And so when we think of those 90% of the students who are not coming to the counseling center, a good number of them do not need therapy, but they do need something. And so the counseling center really wants to play a role in helping all of you know what role you are already playing and what role you can be playing in these students' lives. Because not everybody who has a psychological need needs therapy. Um, 
needs versus resources. Um, there's a lot more need than the counseling center can meet, and I've got a nice little uh, a mighty army reference here. Uh, the church is a mighty army of caregivers. And frankly, if the church was somehow in some fantasy world doing interventions the way Christ plus Freud might be doing for our <laughs> students. <laughs> if you want to hear more about what it looks like when Christ and Freud get together, I teach a class on uh, integration between psychology and faith. So. <laughs> I, I think that the church could do at least half of what the Counseling Center is doing. We don't need to be the ones who are doing half of what we do. It could be us, but what about family? What about professors? What about... Uh, fellow students or uh, RCs, residential chaplains in the dorms, things like that. Um, and then beyond, okay, there's a need, how are we going to meet it? Well, what about the idea of prevention? Yeah. Can we create a campus yeah. culture so that less students need intervention care, whether it's therapy or, or otherwise? And then we want to see ourselves as a direct part of the development and education of the students. We're, we're not in support of. We are a direct part of a system that helps students to develop spiritually, emotionally, psychologically, socially, physically. Um, and in faculty chapel a couple of days ago, if Dr. Khan's expectation is for you guys as faculty to change students' lives, to impact students' lives, uh, we want to be a direct part of that. And, and we want to be direct partners at the same time with you all doing that as faculty inside the classroom, and you know that a lot of what you do is outside the classroom as well. So that's why we want a paradigm shift. We're not just about therapy. We want to be bigger, more than that, and we want to be partners. So the old model, it was we are requested to do this topic with these people. In the newer model, we've done our own research and looked at our expertise and, and what we know about college students and psychological stuff. And, and we've identified the topics that might be most important to talk to campus. And maybe we're proactive in seeking relationships with certain departments and certain groups of students to say, whether you're asking for it or not, I think eating disorders are something we really ought to talk about. I think anxiety and depression are number one and number two reasons why people come to counseling. And so let's proactively talk about that. Um, we wanted to make a change so that we weren't just doing lectures, academic lectures, so that people understood what was happening. That's awareness, and that's great. But what about change? Can we actually bring about change through the way that we interact with students, rather than making them aware of the things that they may or may not be dealing with? Um, and then we don't want to just interact with students. We want to be doing training, consultation, and plenty of listening as well with faculty and staff and administrators as well. And then we're trying to do a lot less one-time hit and run. Let me drop the information bomb and, and I'm done. What if we build ongoing liaison relationships? I've been playing French horn in the orchestra for nine years now because I'm trying to build a relationship with the School of Music so they know me, I know them, and we have an opportunity to consult at that richer, deeper level and in an ongoing kind of way. Um, we have done one-time resilience programming but right now, for students, we're doing five-session models of workshops, not just so they learn what resilience is, but they actually develop resilience. So not just one-time hit and run, but what about ongoing sustained relationships? Um, outreach impact. We, we started with a number of certain topics, whether it's greatest prevalence or college-specific risk, and we already talked about these a little bit, depression, anxiety, eating disorder, things like that. But then also, is there some sort of underlying need that affects eating disorders and depression and some of the other needs. And, and I think resilience is maybe not the perfect only topic, but it certainly is a very universal topic that we can talk to all students and all faculty about, because if students are becoming more psychologically healthy in that resilience sort of way, I think it's really going to stem the tide of some of the things that Mike was talking about and that I was talking about here. So if we define resilience, a very brief, dirty version of it is Surviving, recovering, and growing through adversity. So there's a three different steps to survive adversity, recovering from adversity, but growing through it, not just enduring. Am I a better person because of the adversity that I faced? Um, and this past year, we did 35 resilience-based outreaches for about 322 different people. Outreach in general, we didn't just talk about resilience. We had about 165 outreaches reaching 3,500 people. 
3,400 people. Now, some of those people are probably repeats, but it, it's a pretty broad scope. It's a whole lot more than that 10% number that we might be reaching through therapy. Who have we partnered with in different ways? I've got a staff column here and a faculty or um, faculty or academics column. And so on the faculty side, School of Music, I, I'm I consistently engaged with them. With the theater program, we didn't just go in and do a one-time intervention. Some of my staff went in every other week for four or five different sessions of meeting with theater students and interacting with them. School of Nursing, we're starting to develop all kinds of different types of interventions with the mock disaster and, and some other things. Uh, School of Business, I've been to talk with them two or three different times about <coughs> resilience. Center for Teaching Excellence, I'm standing here right now. Um, <laughs> academic Support, Leap Hub, all kinds of others that aren't necessarily an academic department, but they're within academics and, and directly uh, engaged in, in the academic sector. And then on the staff side, I won't list all of them out, but we have a lot of contacts there. And we don't want any of these just to be one time, Hallie Mark, we interacted with this group. But are we building relationship and helping them see the perspective we have on the psychological needs of students and vice versa? Are we doing a bit of a needs assessment? Are we listening? Are, are we hearing music professors say, hey, I had this student have a panic attack during juries or performance seminar or something like that. Okay, well, anxiety is a pretty important thing for us to talk about. Why don't we design something because you've identified for us some very specific needs that you have. Um, what do we hope that you can do in this dialogue with students' psychological needs and with the counseling center, communicate. That's the first thing. Uh, it, we can guess, and psychologists are sometimes pretty good at guessing and interpreting things, but it's better when we have a dialogue going. So tell student care, res life, counseling center, uh, about student concerns and crises. Um, if you're referring somebody over to the counseling center, give us a heads up. It does make a difference whether a student is coming because they decided somewhat on their own or because a faculty member referred them. Those third-party referrals, we need to do a little bit more work to help them understand what therapy is, the pros and cons of being here, to truly make it a voluntary thing rather than going through the motions because there might be some obstacles, some resistance to actually making progress there. Um, I have a form that I created like three years ago and we just haven't gotten it out there, but there's a, a good referral form that you could send to us and I'm going to upload it to our website and get some feedback from you. Is it a helpful form or not? Just it says, who's the student? What conversations have you had with them? Why are you sending them over to us? What kind of follow-up and contact do you want? That kind of thing. Um, then here is my challenge to you. Get guidance. Whether it's one-time proactive, whether it's reactive consultation, but get guidance. Um, I, I learned from Center for Teaching Excellence, from my wife, from other psych professors, and, and, and from others, how to teach. Because I, I teach a number of classes, and I, I want to learn from your expertise. Uh, learn from Mike, learn from George, learn from me, because there's stuff that we can teach you. Um, consultation or training on students and, and their crises and, and their concerns. Learn about resilience, wellness, and prevention. So that without necessarily doing more with your students, what if you can be more informed and more intentional in what you're already doing? Is there a way to design your syllabus, or the way you do advising, or the way you just interact one-on-one -on -one or with a group of students that's a little bit more psychologically challenging them toward health, or helping them be aware of how challenges in adversity can be a good thing and not a bad thing? It's not necessarily adding an extra lecture in, but are you intentional in the way you interact with them to help them see the psychological help they can be either sustaining or developing? Um, and then when it comes to students who have identified needs, stay engaged. We know that you care, but as a bad example um, from politics, there's, there's a lot of circumstances I've heard about in the news where with homelessness or mental health issues, sometimes a municipality in a certain state or certain other countries, uh, when they have issues with homelessness, sometimes their solution is to give a one-way bus ticket to that person. And I don't want you to see a referral to student care or to the counseling center as a one-way bus ticket. So if you're referring a student to us, that's great. But Hopefully, that's bringing us in to a picture of collaborative care that you are still a part of. Keep caring for students. The care of connecting them to the counseling center is great, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you now step out because we're taking over and you're passing the time. 
but instead, you and I can work together and we can form a collaborative system of care. Because you know these students in ways that we never will at the counseling center once a week outside of the classroom. At the same time, we can get to know students in ways you never can because we're not grading them, because it's totally voluntary, because it's confidential, because of our psychological training. And so you can play a role I can never play. I can play a role you can never play. So let's keep both of those people engaged with these students. Um, and if nothing else, follow up. Follow up with student care or follow up with Res Life or follow up with the counseling center and, and see what's going on on our side with these students that you care about. Um, and follow up directly with the students, especially when you refer to the counseling center because they may or may not sign a release of information. So you call me and I say, I can neither confirm nor deny. <laughs> so follow up with the student. Did you go to the counseling center? What is it like? Is it a good thing or is it not a good thing? Oh, it's not working for you, you don't like it? Can you talk to your therapist about that? Can you talk to the director? Because yes, we are totally open to that. We want to hear if students are having concerns about the experience that they're having with the counseling center. Uh, so what do you do when you have a student that you're concerned about? Beyond communicating, trying to bring about this system of care through referral, it's kind of like when junior high students ask how far is too far. They're never happy with what their, uh, their youth pastor says because they want like this really concrete answer that applies to everybody. I, I think when the counseling center gets to those questions of, well, what am I supposed to do when I'm concerned psychologically about students? There are answers, but they're complex, they're not very simple. And the answer depends on the, the, the particularity uh, that a student is dealing with. So I know it can be frustrating that you can't come to this event, get a handout from me, although I do have a handout, um, <laughs> that, that tells you exactly what you need to do psychologically to help out a student who, who's got a psychological concern. Yes, there are universals that I can advise you in, but every situation needs to be treated a little bit differently. However, when we do try to come up with some universals, number one, uh, express care and concern to the students. So to the students, interact directly with them, not just interact with others about them. A and be intentional about that. It, how are you setting the stage? Are you sending them an email or are you meeting with them in person? If it's in person, did they know what was coming? Is it right in front of class, before or after class, when there might be other people around? Or is it one-on-one -on -one in somewhat of a private environment? Uh, so meeting with students in person, one-on-one, -on -one, private, safe environment, and talking with them. I, I think when you express that concern, I recommend trying to stick with the observable facts rather than the interpretation. Don't say, I think you're depressed, but I wonder if there's some psychological stuff going on here because I've seen that you haven't been showing up to classes often. And because you, you used to turn in your papers on time all the, all, all the time, but now I've got stuff missing. Those are indisputable. The student can't defensively push back against that. But if you say, I think you're depressed, then the student can say, yeah, I can see the same facts as you, but I have a totally different interpretation. Uh, just ask my professors. When I was a college student, and I fought my depression diagnosis for two years before I got the help that I needed. Um, Empathically understand the problem. Uh, one of my one-liners that I use in therapy all the time is curiosity is the antidote to judgment. If you're asking the question why in, in that way that says, of course what they're doing makes sense. If I don't understand, I better keep exploring until I can go, oh, I totally get it. Totally understand it. So if you can ask questions to try to understand the unique particularity of what their perspective is and what their behavior is, any of these destructive or, or ineffective behaviors you've seen, you got to understand why it's happening. They can feel better understood, and that in and of itself is healing. All by itself, just being truly known is helpful. I can do two and a half years of psychodynamic therapy with my clients and process the projections and enactments and all that. If I ask them at the end of therapy what was most beneficial, you truly understood me. And this was a place where I could come in and be open honest and vulnerable and know that I wasn't going to be judged. That's what they all tell me. So it doesn't matter how advanced my clinical training is, it's that empathic, non-judgmental care that they need. And don't rush to advice or problem solving. You, you can go into the whole give a person a fish versus teach a person to fish. Um, 
there's plenty of other ways to kind of look at that with different analogies, but if you don't thoroughly understand the problem, then the advice you're giving probably doesn't necessarily line up and it's less likely to be effective. Even if it is effective, you haven't empowered them to solve problems, you've just solved the problem for them. And you guys are educators, you know that. We want to be empowering them to work through their own problems rather than doing it for them. Then help build a care network. That's where there's referrals and communicating to other people. And then figure out intentionally, what is your role going to be? I'm not asking you to be their counselor. Uh, I'm not asking you to do nothing or to do everything. But be intentional. What role are you going to play? How often are you going to follow up with the student? I'm going to do this for you, but not this. You've got to get that from somebody else. The more you can define that, the less likely you are to offend them because you don't provide what they think that you're going to provide, the less likely you are to burn out, the less likely you're going to be asked to do something you don't feel qualified or comfortable to do. So figure out what role are you playing in their care network as they move through the problem that isn't going to get resolved with quick problem solving, but it's going to take time and some relational journey. And then, as I said before, stay engaged. Uh, stay engaged with these students because this stuff doesn't get fixed with, with one good advice session, but instead we journey with them. Best example I have for that is in Job 2, one of my favorite passages. His wife has already said, curse God and die. I'm glad he didn't listen. And his friends, this guy, that guy, and the other guy, I don't remember their names. They're from far away and have special names. Um, his friends decide together to come and see him and visit him. They see him, they empathically respond. They see him from a distance. And they weep and tear their clothes. And then it says, they sat with him on the ground for seven days and seven nights. And none of them said a word because they saw how great this suffering was. So when I teach people how to do counseling, I tell them, if you can't do that, you can't do counseling. Mm -hmm. Before you learn to do all the psychodynamic or whatever you're going to do, if you can't join, shut up and listen, then, then you can't provide effective care. So if we can do that, if we can genuinely understand, if we can join them in their journey, then whatever multi-causal complex system that has created the depression, anxiety, suicidality, they're going to have a group of caring people, not just one therapist, not just their friend, not just their professor, but a group of caring people who can help them journey through. When I was depressed in college, I count at least eight people who were absolutely instrumental in helping me overcome my depression. One was a therapist. The other seven were not. Some were professors. Some were friends, some were administrators, some were my family, my parents, but it took all eight of those people to help me overcome my depression. And so I hope you will join in collective community caregiving so that we can help these students out. I think that's my last slide. Oh, I got one or two other fun ones. By the way, counseling works. Um, and we're doing a great job at Counseling Center, not to toot our own horn too much. Last year we did almost 5,000 clinical appointments with 450 students. If it's about 100 bucks a session, that's we're doing like $600,000 worth of service in a year. And what I've got in the, the chart here is a comparison to hundreds of the other university counseling centers. Looking at the students who've done at least three administrations of this one particular measure that we give, that means they didn't just get three or four sessions, they've been with us for at least a semester. They've been with us for at least a semester. We are outperforming about 90% of the other university counseling centers in this pool that all contribute data on almost all of these areas of a function, whether it's depression, anxiety, distress, hostility, substance, that kind of thing. We're doing excellent work at the counseling center. I'm really proud of my staff. It takes time, though. Our numbers don't look the same for change or comparative change to other institutions when we just have one or two administrations and we've only had them for three or four weeks. So it does take time. Um, and here's a little bit of what the students have to say. I like some of the therapy observations. Be honest with your counselor. Don't BS your problems. This is the one place where you can freely work through insecurities, baggage, and damage. I love that one. Um, but they tell us in, in these surveys, I don't really trust the numbers sometimes, if you understand statistics, I don't know. Likert scales don't really tell you what they think, what you think they tell you, but some of the words that they share. Your relationship to me has taught me more than three years of college has impressed on me so far. I worked with a, counseling, uh, a counselor there for one and a half years. He saved my life. Don't know how I would have come without his help. 
an intern saying, I learned that God is real and love is real. So we love the role that we're playing on campus. And we would love to work with you in caring for these students. We do want to have a time for you to ask any questions. So I'll try to get through my portion fairly quickly so we have some time for that. But before I do that, I just want to thank all of you for prioritizing this time. This is such an important topic literally life and death uh, for our students. And I've read too many articles where institutions will wait until worst case scenarios happen until we start having these conversations. So thank you for making time and coming today. So what does this look like for our, our students on campus here at Lee? As Mike mentioned, we're not immune to this. Uh, we're dealing with this in the residence halls on a weekly, on a daily basis. So I want to walk you through some statistics from the fall semester and then share with you how we care for our students who are in crisis. So in the fall semester, we had uh, students who reported thoughts of suicidal ideation. We had 25 students who reported that. In addition to that, we had 33 cases where we had to respond, intervene, and do an assessment on a student. And I do want to put in there that a lot of times these are after hours when all offices are closed, usually very late at night where our staff is having to respond. And 33 cases, that's the most in my time in residence life, and I've been in residence life for 10 years now, although I look pretty young. Um, <laughs> and this, uh, it continues to grow, as we're mentioning. And so we need to continue to have these conversations. 33 instances, that's over two students per week that are saying they're contemplating suicide. Over two students per week. I shared this information with our RAs and RCs. We just had training this week. <coughs> and we want to continue to have these tough conversations. No longer can we hide things under the rug. We want this open and so that we can support our students better. So what do we do whenever we hear uh, about a student in need? Anytime we receive a notification, an email, a phone call, sometimes it'll be a roommate telling an RA, or even the student themselves going to the RA or to the RB saying they don't feel safe, we respond immediately. Um, we don't care what the situation is. If it's a false alarm, it's a false alarm. We take every situation serious. We have on-call resident directors 24 hours a day, seven days a week throughout the year. Uh, so if our students have a need, they know what number to call, and they know that somebody would be there to serve them. And I think most of you know this, but a resident director is a full-time professional staff member that lives in the residence hall and is there to serve our students. So we always have somebody on call uh, to meet the needs of our student. And it's very important that as we go throughout the year that our resident directors, our paraprofessional staff are getting trained well and getting trained thoroughly. So we have a continuous training program throughout the year, but our resident directors come back in July. We have a month long of an extensive training where we'll talk about crisis management. We'll go through policies and procedures, uh, emergency protocols. We work with Dave in his office. They'll come in and do some sessions with us. Mike will come in and do some sessions with us. We we need to know how to assess the risk of a student. And our resident directors, our area coordinators, do such a great job at that. Um, so thank you to Mike and Dave and everybody else that we collaborate with in helping keep our students safe. We do the same thing with our RAs. They come back in August. We do about a three-week three training with them. Uh, one of the best training um, materials that we do is called Behind Closed Doors, which it's a two-day long session where we reenact real life scenarios with our student staff because a lot of times when they're coming into these positions, they're nervous about the conflict that's going to happen or some of the crisis that they're going to encounter because they've seen it in their halls before. And so we go through some of these emergency procedures, crisis management response, and they get to simulate what it would be like um, so that when they actually have a real life scenario that's going on in the fall or in the spring, they're prepared to have those conversations. They know how to be tactful in those conversations. Um, and every time we get evaluations back, they say that's the number one thing that helps them be prepared for their job. So we want to make sure our, our staff is trained because 
we have a lot of students in need throughout the year. So what do we do whenever we assess a student, um, we get a call and we assess a student? There's, there's multiple protocols that we go through depending on the situation. So if we assess the student and the student seems safe for the night, an RD will typically write a safety plan with them, which will outline a communication plan uh, for the next couple of weeks. They'll outline what resources we're going to connect them with the next day because at nighttime all the offices are closed. And so the RD or an RA will walk them over to the counseling center or walk them over to the hub or student success um, to make sure that they're getting the help and the resources that they need. After the assessment, if we're not sure uh, if the student is at risk, we will call crisis, the crisis response team and consult with them. So they'll come in, they'll do a more in-depth analysis of the student to see where they're at. If they do need to be transferred to a facility or need to be hospitalized, they'll make that call. So they work with the RDs, they work with our team. They've been a great resource for us. George, can I interrupt for a second? If you don't know who the crisis response team is, it's not a campus agency, it's actually a county or state agency, and, and they do uh, on-site, so they will come to a home, an office, something like that, uh, assessment uh, for hospitalization or, or other severe mental health need, and other than physicians, they're the only people in the state who are allowed to endorse uh, an involuntary hospitalization for psychiatric reasons, uh, and they're available 24-7. And it's not just us who can call, anyone who can call a crisis response team. And then if we ever see an immediate need, a student's in danger to themselves or at risk to others, we call 911 right away, just like Mike mentioned. Our staff is trained to do that. We never want to put our students at risk or even put our staff at risk. Um, so we call 911 right away. And then as Mike mentioned earlier as well, we try to have a re-entry process where we assist our students when they come back to campus. A lot of times, this could be their first time going and being hospitalized or dealing with thoughts of suicide. Sometimes it could be students who have dealt with this several times in the past. So when they come back to campus, it's so important for all of our offices to collaborate. How can we serve this student the best way? because every student has a different need, uh, and so we need to assess each student differently. And that's one thing we talk about in Res Life and Housing. We had 33 cases here, but every student in every situation is different. Uh, so that's why I'm very thankful for Mike and his expertise whenever we go through, we're talking late at night of what, what do we need to do with this student? How do we keep this student safe? What's the next steps we need to take? It takes a village to support our students well. And that's why we're talking to you as well. So going to the collaboration, these are just a few of the offices that we collaborate with, just as David mentioned. Um, we want to make sure that the, we have uh, a handful of care around these students. Um, so we work with David and his team quite often. Uh, Mike mentioned the Student Care Committee. Campus, safe, campus Security has been a big resource for us. Anytime we call 911, they're there to help direct wherever the cop cars go, or ambulance, fire trucks. Um, so they've been a great resource for us. Uh, student success, the hub, health clinic, Mike, and then you as faculty and staff. And that's sort of what I want to get to is how you can help um, as faculty. I think it's so important for us um, to continue to have this conversation because every interaction that we have with the student matters. Every interaction. And as David talked about, you guys get to see a different side of the students, we get to see a different side. We're trying to um, collaborate with all of you and serve as a catalyst for outside of the classroom learning. So what they're learning in your classrooms, we're trying to take that outside of the classrooms and apply it to their daily lives so that whenever they leave, leave they'll be able to go into any community uh, that they live in and they'll be able to use what they learned here at the university. And so. Let's continue to have these conversations, and if you ever see a student in need, um, something's off. I received several emails from, I can see a few of you in here, who have emailed me or emailed our staff, uh, letting us know that this student relayed to me that they're very homesick, or this student is not getting along with their roommate, um, do you think you could check in on that? Or a student hasn't showed up for classes for a week straight. Um, 
We appreciate those emails because a lot of times it's just the tip of the iceberg. And our staff is trained to have some of those conversations of what's really going on. And a lot of times it is way deeper than just they're having a roommate conflict. There's 10 other things that they're dealing with. Um, and so we want to collaborate with you so that we can support our students better. So again, thank you for, for joining us today. And we do want to open it up for a time for questions, if any of you have any questions. If, if you have to leave, we have 55 copies of two different handouts here. One is all the PowerPoints. Another is just a one pager on how to talk to distressed students. Uh, we need to actually go ahead and flip the room because we've got another session coming in at 3. So let me go ahead and say, if you do want to continue the dialogue, please feel free to email me if you want the uh, PowerPoint resources. And David has a copy of the PowerPoint and also a one-page guide in terms of how to have a dialogue with a student in distress. Again, we're here to collaborate, to serve you, and to help our students develop. So uh, send us an email or have a conversation with us. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you.